that's different. Life the way it's meant to be to be lived. So I got a message I want to preach to you guys today that God's put on my, my heart with. We've seen so many give their lives to Christ. We've seen so many be baptized. I just kind of want to invest this message into the life of our church, into the life of, of, of where you're at today. Talking about life the way it's meant to be. You know, we spend so much time trying to learn how to do things right. You know, there's, there's certain things we'll, we'll, we'll spend months trying to learn how to do to do right. Like my son right now, somebody pray for me because he is in that age where, where he's about to get his license. Come on, somebody, right? That's some scary stuff right there. And he is going to spend hours learning how to drive. Like he's got to study and then he's got to take a test and then, and then he gets this thing called his permit and then he's got to spend six months behind the wheel with his permit, learning how to drive, learning how to drive right, okay? And, and you guys, seriously, it's, it's, it's a little bit stressful has anyone walked through this before? You've been through this? Come on, like, I throw him the keys the other day. We're leaving the grocery store. And just for those of you who have not been through this yet, let me give you a little word of advice. Never, never, ever, never make the first time you let your boy drive, never let his experience be that of which is pulling out of a parking spot at the grocery store, okay? Never let that be his first experience. Hey, buddy, you could drive us home. Really? I am still trying to recover from the whiplash of him, him not knowing that when you gave it gas, it was going to go. And so it, we went like literally went, so he's reversing. So it's like, and like, and like cars all around us are like backing up, you know, like, we'll just give you the room. We'll just give you the, we hit a couple curbs in the, in the parking lot, and, but, but Elias, you're going to learn, man. I promise you, it's going to get better, right? He's going to spend so much time learning to drive, trying to figure out how to do it right. And, and he better learn how to do it right, like, like for his sake and ours, right? Are you with me? Like, he's got to learn how to do it right, because if you're not learning how to do it right, there's consequences and everything from tickets to you can get in an accident, and there's all sorts of things that can happen if you don't learn to drive right. So he spent all this, all this time learning to drive right, right? white, depending on what you're talking about. Um, but here's the question is, how do we live life right? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we spend all this time learning to drive or whatever else it might be, but how much time have you spent trying to learn to do life right? You know, when you realize that this is the only life you've got, you've got one life to live, and I'm not talking about the soap opera, you got one life to live, then the pressing question should become, how do I live this life? What is the right way to live? That should be at the top of our list. Are you with me? Do you agree? So here's the thing you need to understand is that God, God doesn't leave us to, to guessing. It's not a guessing game. We don't have to try to figure it out on our own. God reveals to you and I how we are to live this thing called life. It's the, it's the life that God's called us to live. And so what I want to do today is look at what the word of God says about the life that we're called to live. First Peter chapter one, I ask you to turn your Bibles there. First Peter one, verses 14 through 16 say this. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. He's, here's how you're to live. You live looking forward to the day that Jesus, that Jesus is coming. And between now and that moment, you're looking to Jesus the grace that will be brought to you. As obedient children, do not be conformed. Here it is. Do not be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But watch this. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Oh, shoot. They're talking about holiness in church. Yeah, we are. Listen. Scripture says, here's God's will for your life. Here's the way to live life. What it's called is a holy life, a holy life. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about holy. Maybe you think about some, maybe a monk somewhere sitting up in a mountain, meditating, keeping himself away from the world, and that's holy. I don't know what comes to your mind, but I want to show you scripturally what holy is, and I pray it sets some of you free today to live in all that God has for your life. Because church, he's called us to live a holy life. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. I got three things for you about holiness you need to understand. Holiness 
is faithfulness. Holiness is faithfulness. First and foremost, holiness is faithfulness. You know, the word holy, it means this. It, it means to be separated, set apart. That's different. Set apart. Set apart for the things of the Lord. And so when you look into the Old Testament, you'll see this word holy used of the temple. The temple was holy. Why? Because it was set apart for the Lord. The instruments that were used in that temple were holy and that they were set apart for the things of the Lord. They, they were used in the, in the worship of God. They were holy things. And so you see this all over the, tes- the Old Testament, these things that were sanctified or literally set apart as unto the Lord. Those were holy things. And so now today what Scripture is saying to you and I is that you're to be holy. Well, what's that mean? That you're to be different. You're set apart. You don't look like the rest of the world. You don't live like the rest of the world. Your life, my friends, is different. You're set apart, right lives that are set apart and so much more than the ordinary and mundane lives of the world. It's wholly set apart. And one of the things you need to understand first and foremost about holiness is this, is that holiness is faithfulness. Say it with me. Holiness is faithfulness, faithfulness. It boils down really to, you need to understand faithfulness. Philippians chapter three, verse 20, writing to the church, he says this, but we are citizens of heaven. Where'd they get the name for that church? Right there. You are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Between now and the day we see him face to face, we're eagerly waiting. Watch what it says. He will take our weak and mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Therefore, my friends, therefore, what do we do? My dear brothers and sisters, what's it say? Stay true to the Lord. Stay true to the Lord. Maybe your translation even says remain holy or be holy. It's the same word. It means to stay true to the Lord. And it carries with it this sense of faithfulness unto God. See, it's, it's bigger, holiness is, it's bigger than just morality for morality's sake. I mean, how many of you know that when seeking to live a right life, you think, oh, it's, that means a moral life. I gotta live a moral life, right? You with me? Some people, that's what it is. And so let's say you know somebody who's living a right life. They're moral. They make right decisions. Maybe some of you have got a good neighbor. Maybe some of you have got some good friends. And they make right decisions. They make moral decisions. But my friends, making right decisions and living a moral life just simply for the sake of morality doesn't make you holy. Do you recognize that? So you can be living a moral life, but yet not have holiness. You can, maybe you're in here today and you pride yourself on doing what's right and living with morality. But my friends, you are falling short of holiness until the life you are living is being lived as unto the Lord. You see, set apart for the Lord. You're not just living moral for morality's sake. You're living as unto the Lord. It's an act of worship. You're worshiping God with your life. You're you're doing what's right because it's an act of, of worship to God. And that's what marks holiness. Holiness is faithfulness, faithfulness to God. So you could be having two people doing the same thing, making the same decisions, right? Living life in the same way, and yet one is considered holy and the other is just considered moral. Holiness is a faithfulness to God. Holiness is faithfulness. Think about it in the, in the way of, a, in terms of a, of a husband and a wife. A husband and a wife. Tatum and I have been married now for 19 years. Come on, you guys. She has put up with me for 19 years. Can you believe it? Yeah, you're clapping for her like, good job, Tatum. We're so proud of you. I don't know how you did it. Wow, you know, like 19 years. And from day one, I've expected of her and she's expected of me that we would remain faithful. Holiness is faithfulness. Think about it, husband and wife. Faithful to each other. Faithful to each other. That, that her loyalty and her commitment would be toward, toward me and me alone. That when she's out in the, out in the world, you know, because, and she's out at the grocery store, she's out shopping and, and all the guys are picking up on her because they do because she's so darn good looking and everyone's checking her out and, you know, they're trying to, hey, and they're giving her little eyes and all that. She just goes like, I teach her this. She just goes like this, say, excuse me, right? I'm taken, right? I'm taken. 
because I'm expecting her to be faithful, to be committed to me, uh, loyal to me. And she's expecting the, the same thing from, from me. And so she's got to learn to do that because that world out there is going to try to, to pull her in a hundred different directions because she's Tatum and oh my goodness, I married way up, right? We already covered that. And so, but I'm expecting of her to remain faithful and, and loyal to me, that her heart commitment is, is toward me. And it's, it's the same thing with holiness, you guys. Holiness is a, is a commitment, a loyalty to the Lord. You belong to him. A bunch of you got baptized last, last week and, and your shirt said, I'm all in. I, I'm committed to the Lord. And, and it's meant to not just be found in that moment, but it's the way you live your life. Every moment, I'm all in. I'm committed to the Lord. I'm already taken. Come on, somebody. I'm already taken. And that's how we're, we're to, to live our lives. That's what holiness is. It's um, faithfulness. Tatum remains faithful to me. But think about it this way as well. Holiness is faithfulness, not as, just as in a, a husband to wife, but also as picture to picture. Picture to picture. When you make a replication of something, remember scripture said, stay true to the Lord, stay faithful to the Lord. It works in this way as well. Um, when you make a replication of something or, a, or a, a Xerox of something, a picture, a duplication of another picture, if that picture is faithful to the original picture, it will reflect that picture almost perfectly. Are you with me? And if it's not faithful to that picture, well, then there's, there's intricacies of things that are changed and different in the one picture versus the other picture. But if they're faithful to one another, there's a, there's a similarity. They're close to one another. They, they look alike. And holiness carries with it that sense of faithfulness too, is that we as believers would be faithful, stay true to the Lord in that, listen, we are beginning to look more and more like Jesus every day of our life. Christ-likeness. Matter of fact, when Paul was praying for the church in, in Galatians, his prayer for the church is that they would, watch it says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until, what's he looking for? Until Christ is formed in you. He told the church, it's a lot of hard work working with you guys sometimes. Switched on the church. It's like labor pains. It's pretty rough, right? But Paul says, here's what I'm laboring for. Here's what I'm hoping for. Here's what I'm looking for is that Christ would be formed in you, that you would look more and more like Christ, that you would be faithful, a faithful replication of picture of who Jesus is. Friends, we're talking about the right way to live life. And we live life in a way that begins to, that we commit ourselves to reflecting who Christ is. It's Christ-likeness in our life. There's a big word for it. Let me teach you a big theological word. It's called sanctification. Sanctification, what does sanctification mean? It means that you're being set apart from the things of the world and set apart for the things of God. Sanctification, it's what God is doing. And do you know this? It's God's will for your life. Look at what scripture says. Scripture says this, for this is the will of God. How many of you have ever wondered what is God's will for my life? You know, like, that's the, the Christian's biggest desire to know, God, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? And we, a lot of times Christians wrestle with that. But scripture doesn't hide it from us. He boils it down very, very simply. Here is God's will for your life. For this is the will of God for your life. Your sanctification. What does that mean? You living a holy life. You being set apart from the things of the world and set apart for the things of God. That is God's will for your life. But what about this? What do I do about that? Just live a holy life. Be set apart. And here's what you need to understand. The beauty of this is that when you're allowing God to sanctify you and set you apart from the things of the world, which is his will for your life, then God will use that momentum in your life to direct you, to direct you into all the other things that he has for your life. You hear me? Because some of you are asking like, God, what do I do with this thing specifically? And that thing specifically? And this thing, where do I move? And what school do I do? Listen, live a holy life. And God will use that momentum to direct you into the specifics that he has for your life. You are never gonna know what it is to be caught up in that momentum and to live in all that God has for your life until you're allowing this to be a part of your life. Holiness. I wanna live as a faithful unto the Lord. Friends, we're not talking about sinless perfection here. We're not talking about you someday being in a place where you've, you, you never sin, you're never tempted. And, and it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about at the core of who you are, there's a desire to move forward and to, and to grow in holiness and to, to grow in, in grace. 
And it shouldn't be a, du a duty, but a delight. It's not like, man, I gotta go live a holy life. See, because some of you are thinking that, right? I say holy and you're like, oh man, that's tough. It should be a delight for us. Here's what happens. Is that when you give your life to Jesus, and many of you have, there's, there's two things that, that happen. One, many things that happen, but two of which are, one, you are given what, what is called positional holiness, okay? Positional holiness says this, is that you are holy. You are made holy. Thank you for the blood of Jesus in Christ. You are washed. You are forgiven. Jesus said, it is what? Finished. Done deal. Like, you are holy, okay? It's a, it's a positional holiness that you've been given. Like, from the heavens perspective, from you are holy, okay? Positional holiness, but here's the other thing that happens is that that positional holiness that you have been given, who you are in Christ, creates for you, listen, a hunger and a thirst and a desire for what's called practical holiness. Is that I want to live my life in a way that pleases and honors and serves the Lord. Are you with me? Because I, I'm in love with Jesus now. And so I want to live my life as unto him. And it's not, it's not a burden for me. It's a delight. I want to serve the Lord. I, I want to honor the Lord. I want to do what's right in his eyes. There's a hunger and a thirst for, for practical holiness. It's to, to grow and to mature. When you walk with Jesus, you're driven to honor him, to look more and more like Jesus. It, it drives me crazy when people say, and that's why we're talking about this, because this is, it's, it's a very real issue today. I love Jesus. And they're just gonna go on living like hell. It's like, hang on a second. Hang on a second. If you do love Jesus, what begins to happen in your heart when you get around Jesus and you fall in love with Jesus, what begins to happen in your heart is you want to reflect him more. You want to honor him more. You want to live your life in a way that, that pleases him. And so you begin to live your life. You begin to listen. It's called mature in the Lord. You grow in the Lord. You aren't just like, this is the way I live my life. Deal with it. No, he's got a hold of me and he changes me by his grace. Amen. He changes me. And so friends, a lot of us today are stuck because, oh, I love God, I love Jesus, and, but yet we just choose to just live life however, however we please. And my friends, something's missing. Something's missing. When you're walking with Jesus, you, you wanna honor him. And so here's my question for you today. It's simply this. Am I pursuing holiness? Chris, this is all very heavy. Listen, am I pursuing holiness? Here's the other thing about holiness you need to understand. Holiness is not only faithfulness. Holiness, my friends, is this. What? Holiness is freedom. Holiness is freedom. See, Jesus came on a mission. Do you know what his mission was? It was to set some people, what? Free. Do you ever ask yourself, free from what? Free from what? What did Jesus come, Jesus, we know this, Jesus came to set us free, but free from what? What did Jesus come to set us free from? You know what scripture says? Let's look at it together. Scripture says this in John. If the son sets you free, wait, that's not quite, next one. It says this, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, says you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. You're my disciples if you are committing yourself to a life of holiness. I, he says, that's how I'm gonna be able to tell that you're faithful to my teachings, right? And you will know the truth and the truth will help me set you free. He says, here's what happens when you're living within the context of the way I have prescribed for you to live your life. You're gonna be set free. Set free. Free from what, Jesus? Well, they asked him and he says this. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to everyone, anyone. What do you mean we'll be set free? In other words, they're like, Jesus, we grew up in church. Like, what do you mean be set free? Do you know I go to church every Sunday? Do you know who I am? My grandparents were believers. My grandparents before that were believers. My grandparents, I just come from a long line of Christians. We belong to Abraham, Jesus. What do you mean set free? I and mean, this is what Jesus said to them. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Jesus Christ came to set some people free. Free from what? Free from sin. Holiness is freedom, freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. Holiness says, listen to me, 
You don't have to go there. You don't have to do that. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live in addiction. You don't have to be pushed around by that desire or that thing. God has more for you. He can enable you and will enable you to live a life to pursue holiness with it. Freedom, freedom from what? Freedom from sin. You gotta know the truth about sin, my friends. Sin will always promise you the world and leave you as a slave. It'll promise you the world. That's what sin does, right? Think about it. Sin is like this. Hey, come on. If you do this thing, you're gonna be so happy. It might even use the word blessed to sound Christian, right? Like, if you do this thing, you're gonna be so blessed. If you just kind of lie a little bit, if you just kind of color outside the lines a little bit of, you know, color outside the lines of gospel truth a little bit, if you just, you're gonna be so blessed. You're gonna be happier doing that thing, you see. If you just do it this way, you're gonna be, and what is sin doing? It, it gets you to question God's goodness. It gets you to, 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 to wonder, well, maybe that thing is better. And sin is gonna promise you the world. It always does. That's why we do it because it's promising me the world. It's the easy way to go, it's the right way to go. It makes a whole lot of sense. It promises you the world, but it never delivers. Matter of fact, it leaves you in a place where you then need to be delivered because you find yourself as a slave to sin. You find yourself dominated and held down by anything from habits and bitterness to, to spending and addiction or whatever it might be. Those things begin to dominate you. And so you tell yourself, oh, I'm just gonna lie a little bit. Just kind of, just create a half-truth in order to save myself in this, in this situation. And so you lie a little bit. Has anyone ever been down this road? And then all of a sudden you're finding yourself having to lie a little bit more to help you get over the one you just did and then a little more and a little more and pretty soon you've spun for yourself a, a web of lies and you're trapped by it. And there's so many people today, so many young people, so many older people, all of it, they are living trapped by sin. And, and it, it, it holds you down. You, it's promising you life. Come on, come on. It's promising you fulfillment. It's, but it, it never delivers. It just leaves you in the place constantly of needing, of needing to be delivered, trapped. So here's my question for you right now. Is what am I trying to find my freedom and fulfillment in? What am I trying to find my freedom and fulfillment in? In other words, listen, friends, what is promising you freedom and fulfillment right now? What is that thing that's saying, come on, you'll be happier if you do this thing. You'll be happier if you, what is trying to promise you freedom and fulfillment right now? Hear me on this. If those things are not based in a faithfulness to God and a dedication to holiness, then those things will never deliver on their promise only leave you in a place where you need to be delivered. They never will deliver, my friends. They'll always fall short. And friends, some of you are trapped in that right now. You're in that place. You're stuck. You feel that way because that's what sin does to you. And it's a miserable place to be. But here's what Romans says. Listen, Romans says this. Romans says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, that's where you were. That's, that's, that's how this whole thing started, is you were a slave to sin. Thanks be to God that you used to be slave to sin. You have come to obey from your heart that pattern of teaching, which, uh, pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. What's he talking about? This, this holy living that God has called us to. You claimed your allegiance to that. And now watch what happens. Listen, you have then been set free from sin and have become a slave to righteousness. You don't have to live under that sin. You don't have to live trapped by those things. You don't have to live continually hitting your head against that very low ceiling that keeps promising you you're gonna live beyond it. You don't, you don't have to keep moving in that cycle. You know what insanity is? Insanity is when you're doing the same thing over and over again expecting to get different results. And some of you are just, it's, it's just insane. You're thinking, I'm going to keep doing this thing that I know I'm probably not supposed to be doing, but hopefully this time it's going to be good to its promise. Hopefully this time it's going to bring about fulfillment. Hopefully this time, and you just keep doing it over and over and over and over again, and you're stuck thinking it's going to someday deliver, but it never will. Friends, that's insanity. It will never, ever deliver on its promise. 
where am I looking for fulfillment and for freedom? It'll trap you. Usually when we think about holy living, when people think about holy living, they think about some kind of limiting or, or binding life. When in reality, it's the most liberating and freeing life possible because it sets you free from, from having to live in sin. It sets you free from having to be, be trapped. It's freedom. What your heart is craving, hear me, when you are running to that thing other than the Lord and you're trying to find fulfillment and when you're, when you're, when you're running around to those things, what your heart is truly craving, can I tell you, it's, it's holiness. What? Yeah, your life is created to be lived a certain way. And God is calling you to live life in that way. And when you choose to live life outside that way, you, you feel that emptiness. And so what your heart is craving that whole time, my friends, is Jesus. It's just walking with Jesus, just being with Jesus, growing in Christ. That's what your heart is longing for, my friends. Because holiness, listen, is not just faithfulness. Holiness is freedom. And Jesus wants to set you free, my friends. So he calls you forward into maturity. He calls you into growing in him. You know, that's one reason Jesus calls us forward into holiness. It's because it's what's best for you. It's what's best for you. You know, I love my kids. Anyone love their kids? Love my kids. I want the best thing for them, right? And so I, I put in place these things called rules, guidelines, guardrails. You got some house rules? Why do you have house rules? Is it because you're a wicked parent? Your kids think so. <laughs> it's because you love your kids. And so when, my, when Elias is little, I'm like, hey, buddy, don't play with the fire. But daddy is so pretty. I like the fire, right? I'm like, no, don't play the fire. Why? Because it's going to burn you. Well, that doesn't make sense. Dad is pretty. It will burn you. My son probably did not say pretty. That wasn't his word. I, I'm protecting him. And so I put guard lines or, or guidelines and guardrails out. I, I tell him, but guys, listen, don't play on the freeway, okay? It's just a bad idea. You know, you're so mean. We just want to play. We just want to. No, sorry, guys. It's, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. Why? Listen because I care for you, I love you. I'm gonna put some, some guidelines and guardrails out and see, this is what God is doing in scripture. Say, here's what life looks like. Here's how we are called to live. Here's a better way of doing this than what you're doing right now. Here's a better way of doing this than the, than the bill of goods that the world's gonna sell you. Here's how to live life right. The way to live life right is to live it walking with Jesus and all that Jesus has for your life. In that you will, my friends, find freedom. Not restriction, but freedom. You're free to live, to experience life as it's meant to be lived, my friends. And so he calls you into it because sin does the same thing every time. It ruins you and leaves you trapped. I mean, how many families have been ruined by sin? How many relationships have been ruined by sin? How many lives have been ruined by sin? Countless, 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 countless. But I am here today to tell you that although sin may ruin your life. Jesus is always ready to restore your life in the name of Jesus. Amen, church? He restores what sin ruins. He came to set us free, to be set us free from sin. And some of you need that restoration today. It's what Jesus does. He walks with you in this process of being restored. So how? You're like, oh, it all sounds great, Chris. Holiness is faithfulness. Holiness is freedom. I want some of that, right? I want some freedom. I need that in my life. How? How do I do this? How do I, how do I live a holy life? Good question. Here's the last one for you if you're taking notes. It's this. Holiness is found with your feet. Like that one? Write that one down. Holiness is found with your feet. So friends, holiness is faithfulness, holiness is freedom, and holiness is found with your feet. Pastor Chris, what the heck do you mean by found with my feet? Scripture says this in Galatians. I'm gonna give you five things you wanna write down. Galatians says this, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. What in the world does that mean? It means this, my friends, that you live your life. How do I live a holy life? How in the world do I, do I live in a way that honors the Lord and continue to grow? How, how do I do that? Walk in the spirit. Here's what it means means you live your life in step with all that God has for you. 
You, 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 you walk in what God by his spirit is, is pushing you toward. I'll say it like this. You be true to who God is making you to be instead of who the world is telling you to be. Okay? Be true. You know what I mean? Like God is making you to be. Be true to that. Instead of who the world keeps telling you to be. Be this, be this, be this. Just be true. Walk in the spirit. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's that simple. Hard. But that's simple. And how would the Holy Spirit help us to walk? Here's what God's gonna do by his spirit in your life to move you toward living a life of holiness and living a life that is set apart for him to finding freedom and fulfillment. My friends, here's what the spirit of God does in our life. I got five things for you of how, how the spirit of God moves in our life that we, that we would walk. Here's the first one if you're taking notes. Take notes. And here's the first one. It's this, that we walk in the word. Here's what the spirit of God's gonna do. God is gonna call you into living life right so that you can experience fulfillment, live life the way it's meant to be lived. And what the Spirit of God is gonna do is gonna push you to walk in the word. In other words, you will live your life by the word of God. It's not how do I feel or what do I think or what did my friends say? or what? It's like, what does the word of God say? Are you with me? The Bible tells us this in scripture, in the Psalms. <clears throat> it says that his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If I wanna know where to go, God's word says, here's how to get there. Here's how to do life. David said this, I love the law. You're like, David, why do you love the law? It's a law, who loves laws? David's like, I do, why? Because he understood that the law of God was given by God because he knows how life works. He's the author of life and he's, he's simply going, here's how it works. Here's how to do this. Here's, here's, how to, here's how to live the life that I've created you to live. Here it is. And you're like, I don't like laws. It's like, no, this is for your good. Because see, you're gonna make a mess of that relationship. You're gonna make a mess of that financial decision. You're gonna make a mess until, listen, just do it this way. And so we submit ourselves to the word of God, amen? The word of God is the authority. I don't edit it, it edits me. Amen, you with me. The spirit of God is gonna push you. As you seek to live in holiness and rightness, he's gonna push you to walk in the word. Here's the other thing the spirit of God's gonna do. He's gonna push us to walk in faith. What do I mean by that? Spirit of God is always gonna push you to believe that God and God alone is good. Remember I said sin gets its power by tempting us to believe that it is better than God? When you live by faith, when the Spirit of God moves you to walk in faith, you're gonna make this decision. God's good and only God is good. Listen to what James says. James is talking to the church about overcoming temptation. And to the church he says this, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. See, James is saying, there's a world out there that's trying to tempt you going, oh no, this is what's good for you. And this is what's best for you. And come over here and, and do life this way. And James is like, don't be deceived, guys. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, only from him. Anything else is not a good and perfect gift. It never will fulfill. It never will satisfy. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. It's not gonna change on you. And so the Spirit of God will cause you to walk in faith, just to believe God, believe that God and God alone is good. Here's the third one. It's God enables us to live a life that he's called us to live. So the Spirit of God moves us to walk in strength. How many of you feel weak sometimes, right? How many of you feel like, I can't do this? How many of you feel like the, the pressure's too much, the, the temptation's too hard? Walk in the Spirit. God is ready to provide for you the strength you need to move through the temptation that's being presented to you. God is able to provide you all that you need to live a life of holiness. Scripture says this. It says that the temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. Did you know that? You ever go through something you're like, am I the only one who's ever struggled with? I was like, nope. We've all been there. It's a struggle. Am I the only one who's ever had these thoughts? Am I the only one who's ever struggled with that thing? The Bible says this is common to man. We all struggle. Here's what you need to understand in the middle of your struggle. He will not allow you, he will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. See this? So God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But whenever you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can, what's he say, endure. 
So friends, when temptations and pressures are pulling you in directions other than what you know God has for your life, let the Spirit of God push you into the strength that God provides. And the strength that God provides is the strength that will enable you to endure that temptation and, so he's holding you up in the middle of it, and provide a way, what did he say? Out. It's that moment, you gotta be looking for it, that moment where the light bulb goes, bink, that's what I need to do. That's the direction I need to go. I need to get out of this situation. I need to get out of that house. I need to you know, quit that job that keeps moving me in this place where around people that I, there's that light bulb moment. He says, he's gonna provide for you the strength to endure and he's gonna provide a way out. And friends, you gotta look for it. The spirit of God, walk in the spirit and he's gonna give you the strength you need to overcome and to endure. Here's the other one. I like this one. Spirit of God is gonna get you to walk to church, somebody. Come on. You gotta get yourself to church. What in the world do I mean by that? You just trying to say that because you want us all here every single Sunday? Yeah, basically, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm getting at. It's bigger than that. Listen, no, it is that. You gotta get to church. I'm not just making that up. You cannot do this on your own. There is no such thing as a victorious Christian Lone Ranger. It can't happen. You can't live in isolation and live a victorious Christian life. God has built us in a way that we need each other to press one another on. You need some good friends in your life that love you and can walk with you and be, be true with you. Don't walk alone. One of the most painful feelings in the world is loneliness. And God never wants you to have to experience loneliness. There's the body of Christ, this church, other great healthy churches that, that love you and will walk with you into all that God has for your life. You gotta get yourself to church. Let's look at it in scripture. It says this in Hebrews. It says this, let us consider how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. He says, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Listen, I'm giving you permission right now. Would you all just start pushing each other around a little bit? That's what scripture's saying. Spur one another on. Push each other to love and good works. Like, he's, you're supposed to be pushing each other around. You go to church and I'm gonna push you around. Like, how you doing? You good today? I push you around. I'm doing great, man. How about yourself? You going through anything I can pray for you? And you what are you doing? You're pushing one another on toward love and good works. Push another on to all that God has for each other's life. Love and good works toward holiness, toward living lives that are set apart for God. So we're to live that way. The Spirit of God is gonna push you to church. And somebody listen to me. You are struggling today. Some of you are struggling today because you're unwilling to let people into your life. There's some people you gotta get out of your life. And there's some people you gotta get into your life. And you gotta make that decision. God by Spirit's gonna push you to church. And here's the last thing you need to understand as we seek to live lives that honor the Lord, the lives, that, lives the way they're meant to be lived. It's this, that you walk, you walk in grace. God by His Spirit is gonna push you to walk in grace. Thank God for grace. We could not do this if it wasn't for grace. If it wasn't for grace, all we would have is, is being trapped by our sin. If it wasn't for grace, all we would, would have is a life submitted to all these things that are pushing me around. I'd be stuck without grace. But thank God for grace. That God by his grace sets me free from sin. And then God by his grace enables me to walk in a way that honors him. Here's what grace does, my friends. Grace is there when I fall to pick me up, to wash me off and to set me back on my way. It's what keeps me in the game, so to speak. It's what keeps me in process. And I need to stay in process because I'm not perfect. I'm not there. But see, grace keeps, keeps me going. Grace washes me off and, and, and keeps me in play. It's, it's there to forgive me from my sins when I fall into sin. And it's there to help me be victorious and overcome my sin. Grace is that which enables me to walk with God and all that God has for my life. And so friends, you walk and you walk in grace. I love what the, the hymn writer who wrote Amazing Grace said. John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, he said this. He said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I will be. But thank God I am not what I used to be. Come on, somebody. Thank God I'm not what I used to be. Because he, he calls us into more. And I just get so concerned I get so concerned when I hear people naming the name of Jesus. I love Jesus. And then 
and then they just live their life in like hell. Like, I just want to say to you, God has more for you. You don't have to, you don't have to be subject to those things. Sure, sure, you might, you might be saved and you're anchored in heaven, signed, sealed, and delivered, and, and thank God you got that to look forward to. But here's what you need to know. God's got more for you than just fire insurance. He wants you to experience life and life more abundantly now, 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 today. And so maybe you just got to make some decisions to get on track with what that life is. <laughs> and it, you're facing decisions it, it, where you're being tempted to kind of keep coloring outside of God's prescribed manner and God's guidelines. But right now it's happening in your life. And I'm telling you right now, sure, keep coloring that way. Keep, but it will always bring forth destruction. God has so much more for you. Stop, stop being pushed around by that stuff. Make the right decision. God, God blesses that. He infuses life into that. As he walks with you in that. So friends, we, we pursue. We pursue a life that honors the Lord. A life of holiness. Titus chapter 2, last verse. says this. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. What offers salvation? It's God's grace. You can never earn it. You can never deserve it. You're never gonna be good enough for it. Like you can never earn salvation. It's the grace of God. Amen, you with me? The grace of God that saves us. Now watch this. Watch what else grace does. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us. What does grace teaches us? We need the great grace of God to do this. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live lives of self-control, upright and godly lives in this present age. God is concerned about your character. He's concerned about your holiness. Why? Because he's concerned about you. He loves you. And he provides the grace you need to live the life he's called you to live goes on to say this, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own people, eager to do what is good. What marks his people? Eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is right. Why? Because I'm trying to earn salvation? No, because I am saved. I am walking with Jesus. I love God. And I don't, it's like, it's like you go and you get all, your clothes all dirty. It's like, you're, you know, you got your play clothes. How many of you have you like your, like your, your workout clothes? You got your dirty clothes and then you got your church clothes. Some of you don't, you get just some church clothes. No, you don't. Don't get your church clothes on. But you know what I'm saying. So you got your dirty clothes, you got church clothes. When you're in your dirty clothes, it's like, shoot, I don't know, let's go get dirty, right? Let's go work out, let's go, let's go get, right? Because you, you got your dirty clothes on. But what happens when you get, your, you get your church clothes on or you get your, you know, you're going out that fancy, you got that, you got that fancy stuff on, right? Now all of a sudden you're like, ah, I don't want to mess around with the mud puddles of life. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. And in the same way, we've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ and I'm just like, I don't want the junk of this world. I don't want to go in that. I, I, I've changed my wardrobe in the name of Jesus, amen? I don't need that stuff. And there's a desire in me. And God, by his grace, enables us. And so, church, I just wanna call you. Live in all that God has for your life. Don't sell yourself short. And what is that life? It's holiness. Life that's set apart for the things of the Lord.